Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers. Now, right away when we hear the word rulers, we're thinking in the spiritual domain, there are different strategies of authority, right? We know that Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is praying, and Michael shows up going, hey, I would have been here sooner, but I was fighting the, the prince of Persia, right, who's almost bad as the prince over Butte. It's just a horrible thing. So he, he's saying, maintain, there, there's a struggle going on, right, that's not of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, demonic power. There's power in the demonic realm, Deutimus, and against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. So in this unseen realm, there's, there's wickedness, rulers of wickedness. And be rejoiced, because greater is he who's in us than he is in the world. Are you with me on that? So the essence of our battle, let's talk about this. Spiritual warfare is the conflict waged in the invisible spiritual realm that's being manifest invisible in the physical realm. So we have an invisible kingdom that's manifesting in our kingdom. And so we want to be aware, we want to be cognitive that this thing that's going on is very, very real, right? In other words, sport, spiritual warfare is a battle between invisible angelic forces that affect you and me and the cause of war that's something you can't see. And it's hard enough really to fight an enemy we can see, but a whole nother thing when we fight an enemy that we can't see, right? And so we're in this battle. The Paul's going to say it's very real. And, and that's why he says these rulers, our struggles not against flesh and blood. And the verse identifies the enemy, Satan and his, and his demons. Now, they're real. So in this domain that we cannot see, there are angels, angelic beings. There's all types of creatures. You know, I always wonder like, what heaven's going to be like. What is it going to be like? There are creatures that you, have, you can't even fathom. Look at the book of Revelations, 24 elders and just... Things like that, the angels. And the angels, at one time, a third of the angels follow Satan and they fell. We call those fallen angels demons or unclean spirits, and they rebelled against God. And the essence of the rebellion in heaven was Satan who said, I will be like the Most High. And so he wanted to share God's glory. And then Isaiah said, God says, I share my glory with no one. And so that's kind of that battle. Satan saying, worship me and I'll give you all of this. Isn't that what he does to Jesus? He goes, all these kingdoms are mine. Give the, I'll give you all this wealth. I'll give you all these things if you just bow your knee and worship me. And so that's where this battle is. We're in this physical realm where we just get bombarded constantly by spiritual things, right? These idols, and they're really idolatrous. That's why God says, you shall have no other idols before me. And we get this idea, like, well, if I just have this, I'll be happy, right? Where God says, listen, if you just have me, you'll have joy unspeakable, right? And so the essence of the battle, it's spiritual. It, it's unseen. It's foundational for Christianity. We believe in the realm of the unseen. We believe that in this world is only temporary. Heaven and earth are passing away. The Bible says in Isaiah, this earth is like an old worn garment. It's going to pass away. And we're going to get a new heavens and earth. We're going to get upgraded. Is that awesome? And the Bible says, no eye has seen, no, no ear has heard the amazing things he has stored for us. You can dream up the wildest thing going, oh, man, I love it when I'm out in nature. This is so awesome. And God says, that's just a black and white photo. Like what I have for you is going to be so out there, it's going to be like 3D imaging. It's going to freak you out, right? No eye has seen. It's not even on the radar. You're like, what's heaven like? Man wants to make you look like heaven's like a bunch of Gerber babies going around, you know, sitting there in clouds, you know, and stuff like that. God's saying, man, you're going to be in from the greatest adventures. You're going to rule and reign with him, right? Amen. Kind of amazing. So the essence of the battle. Second thing, a foundation for the principle of spiritual warfare. Everything we see is visible. It's in the physical realm. And, and it's influenced by this invisible realm that's going on. Now, there's two worldviews, and a worldview and there's actually a lot more than two worldviews. I'm just going to talk about two worldviews. But a worldview is the glasses that you put on that you see reality. They, they make your reality like this is how it is. Now, one worldview is called a naturalistic worldview. And what that says is everything we see is reality and there's nothing beyond this. It's materialistic, right? It's, it's a materialistic worldview. People who, who um, hold this view seek life answers in the natural realm. And the naturalistic view is not sufficient because it doesn't answer a lot of questions. And it doesn't really make sense to me anyways that this is all there is. I think it takes more faith to believe 
that there is not a God, and there's more faith to believe that this, this is all there is than to believe there's a God. Now, why do I believe that? Well, I just believe it scientifically. Why do, Pastor Nick, what are you saying? Well, a lot of the stuff that we believe in this naturalistic worldview that we teach in schools, isn't that funny, by the way? I'll get into that a little bit later. But we teach that this is all there is, right? It takes a lot of faith to believe in that. Matter of fact, let me give you an example of what that looks like. An absolute zero, if you're a mathematician, is 1 to the 1,074. So 1 to the 1,074 is an absolute zero. The probability of inorganic matter, this table, just becoming the most simplest amoeba, okay? Not even talking anything else, but just a living matter or a living amoeba. The probability of that happening is 1 to the 36th power. So, Pastor Nick, what are you saying? Well, 1 to the 1,074, you got, you know, you got just four digits there. But we're talking 36 digits out. So what is that saying is this? You keep adding time to it, and it doesn't matter. There's not enough time in the, in the world as we know it. If you're an old earth or, or even a new earth, it's billions and 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 billions, and billions of years, and it's never going to come out. There's just not that much time. And it doesn't explain a lot of things that we now know that Darwin didn't know. 1953, Watson and Frick, they discover DNA and RNA. So what is that? Coding, okay? So somewhere down the line, somebody with coding, we kind of get coding, right? You code something, and then you, you, know, you get on your computer or whatever like that, right? But when we look at just the very design of who we are, somebody coded information. And how did that come about, right? So for example, if I had a hard-boiled egg, I would look at it, and, and, and it, this is always that, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Because in an egg, when you hard boil it, you'll notice this. Or maybe you never notice, just gobble them up, make them into deviled eggs. <laughs> but when you look at that, next time you peel a hard boiled egg, there's like always a little dimple in that hard boiled egg. What is that? That's an air pocket. How did that get there? It, it gives that chicken, when he's coming out, it takes six hours when he's ready to get out. It takes him six hours. That's six hours worth of air so he can peck his way out. How many billions of years did that take? I only got like three hours. <laughs> <laughs> or, for example, how did this happen? You were born when you leave your mother and you, you leave and you click off of her system. There's a muscle that's only fired once in your life that clicks off, that activates once you're born and now allows you to breathe on your own and that. How many billions of years did that take to develop? I think it's a lot more feasible to believe. And it doesn't explain where matter came from. It's matter like, what, you know, it's like the, the evolutionists have said, you know, God and ev evolution. You know, go get your own sand. I'm, I'm the one who made it. God's saying that, right? It, 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 how did that stuff come about? It doesn't explain any of that. I think a more logical explanation is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's the one. He's the master coder. He's the master watchmaker. He wound everything up. And it, listen. When it comes to RNA and DNA, the, the evolutionists will say, well, just mutations added. Mutations never add information. Yeah, I'll grant you there's microevolution. A moth can change colors. It's still not an elephant. <laughs> Are you with me on that? I don't know. How did that happen? You know, it's just millions of years. One day it's like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. That takes a lot of faith, you know. That's a weird-looking butterfly. <laughs> Sorry there, Josh. That's why no one sits in the front row. They know. <laughs> so sorry about that. So this first worldview is all natural. And, and, this, and it, it depends on how you see it. The second one of this interview, it's a spiritual worldview, right? The second category, spiritual worldview, says there's a realm outside of this physical world. And that's the essence of Christianity, right? And, so, and it's also possible to really have a spiritual worldview. It might be a, a, a Christian worldview. There's a lot of spiritual, a lot of like new agey stuff that's out there today, right? So your worldview colors the way that you see reality. If you believe this is all there is, you're going to live and go for it and everything that's here. And can I just say, if this is all there is, who's to tell you what is right or wrong? If there's no God, well, I can do whatever I want to do, right? Well, who are you to tell me what is right or wrong? Like, where are you getting it? Is it like a cultural thing, or how does that operate? Ecclesiastics 3 says, in every man, God puts a sense of eternity. But if there's no God, party on. Who's to tell you what is right or wrong? And by the way, that worldview affects our culture, doesn't it? 
So this is the impact. I'll give you four different areas of this battle. Number one, the battle, the spiritual battle that's going on right now, it affects your personal life, right? Uh, if the enemy's come to steal, kill, and destroy, what he wants to do with, he wants to mess with you. He wants to hurt you, right? And in his perversion, and this is evil, he wants to wound you, right? And he'll wound you through a number of different things. He can wound you through offenses or anger or any of those things. That's why we can give a devil a foothold in our lives, right? In Ephesians 4, 25 and 20, through 27, Paul's telling the church of Ephesus, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth. Don't believe the lie. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Isn't it possible to be angry and not to sin? And he's gonna say this. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give the devil an opportunity or a foothold. So how does that happen? If you have unforgiveness in your life and you're thinking, man, I got a right and they hurt me and da 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 you're festering on that, right? And you don't deal with in the day, this is written to the church in Ephesus and he's speaking to believers. He's saying, listen, if you don't forgive, you don't deal with that day, you're gonna give an opportunity for the devil to have a foothold in your life. And so you need to deal with the, those things because otherwise you've opened a door up to that spiritual world, right? Many Christians today are suffering because of anger that's not been resolved. And if Satan can seize your emotions, he can destroy your ability to function by crippling us emotionally. And then we get this like destructive or addictive behavior and we start blaming other people, right? Don't we do that? Right, I'm this way because, right? I'm this way because. It's always our parents, right? I'm this way because my mom and dad, my mom ate too much cabbage, was in the womb, she had gas, I came out this way. Right, we're always blaming somebody. And, and really two different mindsets, right? Two different mindsets, fear and faith, they can be defined the same way. Fear, the belief that something that hasn't happened will happen. Faith, the belief that something that hasn't happened will happen. We can have victim mentality or victor mentality, right? I'm this way because, we start blaming other people. Victor mentality says, I'm this way because the king of all kings came, he gave his life for me. I can live victorious through him. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I'm no longer a victim. I'm a victor. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. My identity is not over here. My identity is in him. And I'm tired of being victimized and blaming other people. I'm in a spiritual warfare. I'm going to start acting on the word of God. And so it can affect you, it can affect your family, right? The devil is one, he's the first one who messes with the first family. Adam and Eve, what a messed up family. You know, they got Cain and Abel, you know what happens there? You know, two brothers killing each other. Right in the very first book, he loves to steal, kill, and destroy, and mess up your family. And, and ladies and gentlemen, we are in a culture today where family is being attacked, Right? I mean, oh my gosh, what it was on The View the other day, and those ladies are making fun of Mike Pence. They're saying Mike Pence is some kind of psychosis because he thinks he can hear from God. That's an attack. Yeah, that's John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. That's normative Christianity, by the way. And families, can I just define families? I thought in all my 37 years of ministry, I got to define what a family is. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. It's between a man and a woman. What's up with our culture saying, well, you got to accept this? We are in a culture warfare. This domain of the materialistic world is saying, this is how things look. And God over here is saying, no, that's not my design. That's not my creation. And it's becoming very unpopular to speak out against that. You're going to get labeled, well, you're a homophobic. You're not, no. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Jesus isn't homophobic. He's none of those things, right? And so Paul, Paul's uh, context of marriage. Hey, marriage is a sacred estate. It's a sacrament. It's a covenant made between a man and a woman. In that covenant, you got a green flag to go for it. Couples, go for it. You know what I mean? Let the games begin. Paul says, let the marriage, marriage bed be undefiled. Why am I saying this? I know couples, let me just read this to you, and I'm going to read Paul, I'm going to read out of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 7, 5, stop depriving one another except by agreement. Except by agreement. Are you on page with this? I'm on page with this. What's my point on this? I know couples that get offended at each other and they manipulate each other with this. Pastor Nick, why are you talking about it? Because it goes on. 
I, you know what? If, if, you, if you're a visitor here, I'm, I'm totally not politically correct at all. That's not my goal. I want to be biblically correct. I'm the worst. Stop depriving one another, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 and 5, except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together again. Why? Lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So what's the purpose of that? Couples, you do this to keep Satan out of your house. Otherwise, all these other weird stuff, resentment, anger, start festering up. And then what happens? You made a foothold, right? Oh, Pastor Nick, this is good. I'm getting this tape today. So it has an effect on your family, has effect on your life. Spiritual warfare has an impact on your life. Paul's going to tell Tim Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1, beware of the doctrines of demons. Now, what is the doctrine of demons? They seek to hinder the purpose of God and extend the power of Satan, Satan's desire to rule over us, right? So in that, let me just list out three things that we see with doctrine of demons. Number one, lies about God. Demons always lie about God, right? Oh, if he was really a good God, then why is there evil in the world? Why do good, bad things happen to good people? Because there's a devil. And God could have made you at like an Autobot, right? I love you, Lord. But instead, he gives you free will. Free will is kind of scary. Freedom is scary. Because in freedom, you have the ability to choose. And way back in the day, man chose to fall. That's a curse. Thus, there's evil, right? So if you're wondering, like, why is there evil? There's a war going on right now. Let me just tell you, I've read the end of the book. We win, okay? But until that time, you're in warfare. And yeah, there's evil. There's perverseness. There's just wicked things going on. But the devil wants to lie to you about God. He doesn't really love you. He doesn't really care about you. If God really loved you, then why did you have to go through this? Well, the Bible says, consider it all joy when you encounter, not maybe if, when you encounter fiery trials. And last time I checked, a fiery trial is not an easy thing. It's a hard thing. Why do I got to go through the hard thing? I'll tell you why. UC Berkeley, they did an experiment. I forgot about this. And what they did, they took amoebas and they put them in a peach tree. I don't know what this looked like, but they took amoebas and they put them in a stressful environment, and they took another tray of amoebas and they put them in a stress-free environment. I don't know what that looked like. Oh, I'm just chilling in the peach tree dish. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. But UC Berkeley, I guess they did. And what they found was, that the, the amoebas that were under stress, they became stronger and survived. The ones that had no stress, they died. Consider it all joy. You encounter very, right? It's like the sticker I got on the back of my truck. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Except bears. Bears will kill you. <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> so lies about God, doctrine of the demons, right? Lies about God's word, right? What God has said. There's just a lot of, right, there's just a lot of twisting of scripture, right? Like, let me put it this way. We can get deceived. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about deception. Paul's going to tell the church, he says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, swindlers, covetous, homosexuals, drunkards shall enter the kingdom of God, and such were some of you who practice such things. I get people all the time, and they're deceived. Right? A person come up to me, they're living together. That's fornication, sex outside of marriage. And what they said to me was, we're married in God's eyes. I'm like, no, you're not. You're fornicating. You might think you are, but have you gone down? Do you have a marriage certificate? Well, no, we just, no, then you're not married. Did you go for a preacher and he pronounced you husband and wife? No. Then you're deceived. All the married couples are like, amen. <laughs> you're deceived. Marriage, it's a sacrament. It's a state that you go up until you come into covenant. And you're going to say, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse. Till death do us part. <laughs> <laughs> you're in it. And it's holy. And it's not just, what well, we live together. That's society. I don't care if you have a common law or whatever. Get married. <laughs> well, Nick, what's the answer for that? Celibacy. If I'm in a homosexual thing, what's the answer to that? Celibacy. It goes either way. Oh, this is good. Woo! <laughs> Starting to sweat. So we twist God's word, right? Are you with me on that? There's another one I love. Don't judge me. Don't judge me, man. God wants me to be happy. Where do you see that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, we don't judge people who are outside the body of Christ, but rather now we judge those who are in the body of Christ. 
God wants me to be happy. Where do you see that? The book of hesitations. <laughs> I'm just saying we got some weird stuff. I'm not, if you're going to come into marriage counseling and talk to me again, I'll just tell you, I'm not going to counsel anybody who's like, I'm just not happy in my marriage. Who cares? I don't care. I just don't care. Where do you, well, you're not happy. Welcome to life. For better or for worse. You made a vow. And then the pastor's going to ask you, do you choose this person? And you chose them. <laughs> they might they have been a hottie, but then they're naughty now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you made that stand in front of friends and family. Why do you got everybody showing up? It's a covenant, and it takes witnesses to establish that covenant. And you went into a covenant. It's not contractual. And if you're married, I've been married 31 years. It needs to be that Clint Eastwood movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's going to be good. It's going to get bad. And, yes, it's going to be ugly. Let's get ready to rumble. Be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down upon your anger and give the devil a foothold. So there's lies about God's word and his promises to people. And then there's just lies about God's people, right? The nation of Israel, the kingdom, of, and how we are being born again. We're a new creation in Christ. That's who you are if you're born again. Old things have passed away. I can't change the old. I can't make it any better. It's dead. I can only work on the new creation in Christ. And so... These teachings that you'll get. And so even in the early church, you know, Paul's going to say, he's going to lay this out and he's going to talk about these false teachers who would forbid marriage and commanding me to abstain from meats. Like, let me just tell you early church history and heresies. First, first couple of centuries, it's all about what theologians call Christology. Who is Jesus? And these heresies come up. So in the book of Galatians, this is written to a group called the Judaizers. And they're trying to make the whole church go back to the law. If you're really Jewish, if you're really Christian, get circumcised, observe the Sabbath on this day, do all these things. And then you got this other group, these Gnostics. And they're definitely not in the law. They're in the, woo! And it's called antinomianism. So antinomian is anti against the law Hey, it's all grace, kind of what we're seeing today, hyper grace, right? It's grace. Do whatever you want to. You're forgiven. Woo! Right? Somewhere down the line. That's why Paul says in Colossians 2.17, let no one judge you as to what you eat or drink or what day you observe the Sabbath on. It's not about that. And so Jesus is going to come on the scene in John 13, 34, and he says, a new commandment I give to you. A new commandment he gives you. We got 10. What's the new commandment, Lord? That you love one another. Just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples by the T-shirts and the bumper stickers you wear. All people will know you're my disciple if you love one another. And this thing about love, it's all the law is fulfilled there. But he's going to say in Galatians 5.14, Paul's going to say the whole law is fulfilled in this statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, not law, covers sin. And it's hard to love. Love doesn't seek its own. Doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It's not about you. That becomes idolatry. Look at you. Whoa, it's not about you. If you love somebody, you have to lay your life down. Love doesn't seek its own. Doesn't act unbecoming. Doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Love is kind. It just freaks me out how many mean Christians there are. If love is kind, we just got to be the kindest people in, in the whole place on the face of the earth. People are like, man, how do you love me? I'm so, so, so difficult. Yes, you are, but I made a choice to love you. And you're difficult. When you're down, I made a choice to love you. Love perseveres. It takes courage to love. Love went to the cross. Love was brutalized. And it wasn't fair. He was sinless. He was brutalized. Oh, it's hard to love. And so when Jesus says, we look at all the Christianity, it can get so confusing. I like it that Jesus comes up because, hey, you got all these laws over here. Listen, there's just, this is, I give you a new commandment. And all the law fulfills on this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. It's real easy, isn't it? But I like keeping the law because when I keep the law and no one doing things, and then I feel better about myself because I'm keeping the law and you're not. And then the other group is like, I'm just lawless. <laughs> all right, this is so good today. Woo! And so the battle affects culture, right? In Daniel 10, he talks about, listen, the prince of the power of the air. I'm in this culture. And can I just say, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a cultural war in our country today. 
I mean, go figure. We've had gun in our country for 300 years, and now all of a sudden something's coming up. That's crazy. It couldn't be that we've taken the Ten Commandments out of our school, that we no longer teach Bible in our, cl- in our schools anymore. We just teach them that you're some random effect of culture, and we look at stuff. I mean, look at all the shootings. Like, my gosh. And the thing in France, I can't believe it in France. Remember the one that happened on the beach in France? Some guy went into a car show, and he bought a truck, and they didn't do a background check on him, and he walked away with a truck. I can't believe he's driving a truck. Some of you are looking at me. Don't flip me off. I love you, okay? (laughs) I'm just saying. It's not guns, and it's not the truck. It's a hard issue. It's a fallen culture. And Christians, can I just say, it's now we got it. It's time to start rising up. There's a difference between, like, nice people and people with conviction. When Paul and Peter walk into town, they're like, oh, look at those nice boys. They call them the sons of thunder. I love that, man. It sounds like an MMA thing, right? (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, now coming into Jerusalem, the sons of thunder. I think that's cool. I like, ladies and gentlemen, now coming to come, these really nice guys. World changers. They don't want to offend anybody. We got to speak up. Amen. God's giving you a voice. Do it lovingly, but do it emphatically. The location of the Bible, uh, the thing, in heavenly places. And so the Bible talks about three dimensions in, in the heavenlies. The first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. First heaven is this earth. That's where we dwell. Second heaven, cosmos where angels and and demons dwell. The third heaven is in the presence of God. It's in his throne room. And the third heaven, Jesus, right? He raises again from the dead. He ascends. He sits at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing there? He's interceding for us. What else is he doing there? Acts 2.33 says he sits down and he says he receives the promise in the context of the day of Pentecost, which, by the way, is that weird, day of Pentecost? Tongues of fire are coming off of people's heads. They think they're drunk and it's 9 o'clock in the morning, okay? Are you with me on that? I always love when people go, well, God's not weird. I mean, how would you like to be there on the day of Pentecost, right? <laughs> hey, Bob, you got a light? <laughs> sure. <laughs> people are speaking. I mean, don't think God's weird? Like, look at Ezekiel. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'm listening to you. What do you want me to do? Ezekiel, I want you to lay naked on your side for a year and cook your food with human dung. That's weird. How would you like to go to his church, by the way? Hi, Pastor Ezekiel. <laughs> kind of weird he gets done he gets done and you know Ezekiel goes hey Lord I've never done this can I just cook my food on animal dung and so he negotiated with God and then he gets done after a year and what Lord what do you want me to do now lay naked on your other side for you that's kind of weird are you with me on that Jeremiah yes Lord I want you to wear your loincloth I want you to wear the equivalent to your underwear I want you to wear your underwear for a full month (laughs) what's new (laughs) He gets done with that. Lord, what do you want me to do now? I want you to bury your loincloth, your underwear, under this rock. Thank you, Jesus. It's a good place for it. So he leaves it under a rock for a full month. And then he's like, Lord, now what do you want me to do with this? Remember that underwear that you wore for a month? You buried it under the rock for a month? Yes, Lord, can't forget that. I want you to put it back on and wear it for another month. Then it only gets better. Lord, what do you want me to do now? I want you to get a pole. I want you to put your loincloth, your underwear on the pole. I want you to walk through Jerusalem and tell Jerusalem that their sins are like this. If I saw Pastor Rod walking down Central, (laughs) I would think, I personally would think that's kind of weird. I'm so far off my nose right now. Start praying. It's intercede. Thank you, Jesus. So this this realm of the third one is, is heavens where he sits. And in this place that God sits, he pours out his spirit. And so Acts 2.33, Jesus sits down. He receives the promise of the the Father. This is a Luke thing, Luke 24.39. And here we are back in Acts 2.33. He receives the promise from the Father. Peter says that what you both see and hear is the outpouring of this promise. Isn't that cool? So when you see and hearing, people are, people are speaking in tongues. They're seeing fire come off their head. And, and I get this visual of Jesus sitting down by the Father and saying, hey, God, yeah, Dad, I made it. Here's my throne, son. You're going to sit right next to me. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, can I have the promise? 
and he's going to be pointed out. Peter says, that's what you both see in here. This is the promise that Jesus receives. He's pointed out and seeing all this stuff happen on earth. Out of the spiritual dimension, it's happening on earth. And in Acts 2.39, Peter says, and this promise is to you, your children, and to as many that are far off that are called by God. I'm just saying. He says this to, by the way, how would you like to be the last person in heaven? I made it. <laughs> I made it. High five. You'd be like the Omega Man forever, right? Omega Man, last one in. Woo! <laughs> okay. Sorry. The enemy in the battle, and this enemy is very, very real, right? Uh, these, these, as we read in Ephesians earlier, the ru- spiritual rulers and authorities that happen in this domain. And there's an enemy in, the ba- in, the, in this where we become victorious. Revelation 12 depicts a day when the invisible warfare in the heavenlies will break out in a very visible realm. In Revelation 12, 7, it, show, it tells us this. It says, Michael and his angels will wage war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels wage war. There's going to come a, a day where finally God said, okay, listen, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a God who's just. And anytime there's evil, evil needs to be judged. And there's going to come a time and period where God will bring justice. And what I love about this is when God brings justice, he doesn't have to do it himself. Like, Michael, go take your business, okay? I'm, I'm too busy to deal with this. Got any other angels want to go with Michael? Because the battle belongs to me. So the battle's not for land. It's not for anything physical. The battle's for glory. And the Lord's going to say in Isaiah 48, 11, he goes, my glory I'll share with no one. And Satan's always been about trying to take the glory that only belongs to God and having people give him glory. And we look at our culture today, we have a very idolatrous culture. You go to other places, you go to places like when we go to Thailand or wherever we go into, and it's evident what their culture is, like what the idols are. I want you to do this. Next time you see somebody from another country come in our country and go, what idols do you see in America? You know what we value? We value money. And so 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul's going to say this. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God shares his, his glory with no one, and we want to bring glory to him to establish that. So the enemy's strategy, let me wrap this up. The enemy's Satan's battle strategy is in spiritual warfare. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy you. And and 2 Corinthians uh, 2.13, Paul says, I am afraid, least as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. The devil wants to lead you away from the simplicity of Christ. What what did I talk about how simple Christianity is? Love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments. That's pretty simple. That's the simplicity of Christ. And the devil wants to lead you astray from that. Oh, no, no, do all this other stuff. And, and it just sounds enticing. I get that. I, I got a doctorate. There's something about education, and, and I value education. But there's something enticing. I think there's a spirit over that when you start studying and getting into that realm. And, and there's just something enticing about that that leads me back to the simplicity. So as we close out today, I'm going to have the ushers come forward. We're going to receive communion today. And this is what I want you to do is they're coming down, passing out the elements. But I want you to, to reflect in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul will say to examine yourself and, and to look inside yourself before you, as you're holding on to the, these elements. And what's an amazing thing about receiving communion is we're reminded that an invisible God became man. That God left that invisible domain and he became man. I want you to hold on to that. And I want you to reflect on a couple different things. God became man. And what things am I dealing with now? What battles that I'm dealing with? that belong to the Lord. It might be your anger issue. It might be addictions. It might be something relational. It could be financial. It could be any of those things. And I just want you to look as you're holding on and even visibly look at the elements and go, Lord, this belongs to you. This person belongs to you because I'm wrestling not against flesh and blood. And I want you to go inward. Now, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't want you to receive communion. But if you're curious about this, right now would be a wonderful time to ask Jesus in your life. And as you're looking into this, be reminded that he came to earth, that he rose again from the grave. And he's coming back soon. So reflect on this just a moment.
you, Lord. Just the, the whole theology of communion can get a little weird. Catholics believe so much in the presence happening that it literally transfigures into the little blood and flesh of Jesus. Protestants, we flip the other side. We just do it like as a, a, a ritual. I think somewhere in between is, is reality. And so, Lord, we invite your presence with us right now. We invite your presence to come right now. And we say, thank you, Lord, that you're with us right now. You're here right now. Lord, as we're holding on to these elements, we're reminded that, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. We're reminded that this battle isn't ours. And so, Lord, as we come, some of us might feel defeated today. Some of us might feel overwhelmed. Some of us might feel unempowered. But, Lord, the reality is, is that we shall receive power to be a witness. And the Lord, in our weakness, you're made strong. And even going to the cross, Calvary, was, was no sign of weakness. You acquiesced. You prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if all possible, let this pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so, Lord, in us following you, we say, Lord, not our will, but your will be done as we take of the bread. We hold the cup up. I was reading uh, early church history, and they have uh, all these councils and all this other stuff that they, they proclaim. And there was a council in 600 called the Council of Laodicea. And they're writing a rebuke to the church. And a lot of times when we receive communion, it's like very solemn kind of atmosphere. But what was going on in 600 AD, communion became a, a great party. And, and so they're, they're telling them, like, hey, you guys, you have it. Don't party as much. Right? They're trying to bring a little moderation to it. And I'm thinking, how did they get to this place that communion turned into a party? And this is what I think. Revelation 12, they overcame by the blood, the blood of the Lamb. And there is something so celebrative in that, like, woo, time to limbo. <laughs> and time to have joy. And the battle belongs to you. So we turn to this fester thing, and only to say, Lord, we hold up the cup, triumphant, rejoicing, thankful, grateful, overwhelmed, amazed, in a state of awe and holiness that you came and you died for us. We're pierced for our stuff, our iniquities. So, Lord, we take it the cup.